Now it's great. Brandon decided to have a speech right beforehand for me that was way more compelling than I would ever give. So thank you, Brandon, for that. I appreciate it. No, that's great. That's really helpful. So I'm going to tell you guys a secret. Can you guys keep a secret? No, seriously. Just put your, put your phones away. I've lived my life in public service. I uh, help run a company called Code for America, which do you guys know? and then was the chief data officer for LA, and then now I'm the chief innovation officer here in Sacramento. So public service is my life, and I will tell you this, that I actually keep a copy of the Constitution in my pocket. <laughs> so here's the secret, though. I've never voted in a federal election. Yeah, a lot of people are gonna like, say that I can never do anything else because I said that. So yeah, I know that. But there's an important reason for that. And an important reason I think we should talk about, and which we want to talk about today. Because when you think about what the federal government has done in the last eight years, it's limited, right? So the last major piece of legislation that the federal government has passed was the Obamacare Act, right? That was six years ago. Everything else since then, immigration reform, held up in the courts, new people on the Supreme Court held up. And I think this is most best signaled by the fact that there was a study done recently about the level of trust in federal government. And 23% of people trusted federal government. 23%. On the flip side, local government had 73% of people trusting their local government. So that means of all of you, so if you look around, there's three of you that likes local government, and one of you likes federal government, and so you guys can figure out which one is which. <laughs> no, just take a second and do that. And what I want to talk about today, um, with the time that I've got, is why I think that's the case. I think there's a really important an exciting reason why we love local government and why we can do exciting things with local government now, here, today. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of why. So I used to run this company called Code for America, and we focused on helping cities solve problems with technology. So this is a picture, uh, two pictures, of New Orleans and blight, so vacant housing in New Orleans, right? Um, this is a big problem in New Orleans, of course, um, after Katrina that there was a lot of vacant housing there, right? Thing is, by the way, it's not just a problem in New Orleans. It's a problem everywhere, right? I'm from St. Louis, and I will tell you, when I talk to the mayor, he says this is one of the biggest problems they have, and it's one of the biggest problems here in Sacramento, too, because vacant housing are hotbeds for crime and really not good for that neighborhood, right? So cities have to figure out how to deal with it. Um, what was fascinating when we were in, in New Orleans is there's this woman, she's wonderful, her name's Miss Rita. Um, she cared about her community. She was older, retired, didn't have anything else to do with her time, so she wanted to focus on figuring out what's going on with the community. And so she would literally, with paper maps, track what's going on with vacant housing in her community. Like if you walk into her house, you would see these big pieces of paper, which are apparently called Tom's Guides, that I'm too young to know what those really mean, um, <laughs> all around her house that she's tracking manually what's going on. But here's what's fascinating. The mayor had the same problem. So the mayor was asked by citizens all the time, hey, Mr. Mayor, what's going on with vacant housing in this place? What's happening in that specific place? area. And he didn't have an answer, because he didn't have the information or the data to answer that question, right? So he asked his chief information officer, can you build an application to solve that problem? Can you build an application on my iPad that you can tell me what's going on? He's like, yeah, sure. It's going to cost me $3 million and take three, million, three years, because that's usually how government does business. But we took a different approach in New Orleans, right? What we did instead was we opened up all the data and the information around what's going on with vacant properties and blighted properties in New Orleans, 
and said, hey, hackers, people in the community, can you build something on this, right? And we deployed, when I was in my old organization, Code for America, we deployed Code for America fellows to build something on top of that data. And we built a really simple application called Blight Status. You can look up an application, uh, address and see exactly what's going on, right? You can see that's where it is in the status of either demolishing it, reselling it, et cetera. And you can also see at a macro level what's going on in a general community, right? So that itself is interesting. Um, but the thing I want to talk to you guys about, what I think is most important and interesting, is do you want to guess who the main user of the application was? It was Habitat for Humanity. Yeah. So it was literally a community organization that needed basically effectively a CRM to track what's going on in the community. And this provided them that application, right? So that, I think, is what's most exciting about building new technology for cities, is that you can empower people who aren't technological, right, to do things that help their city better, which is why I think the future of cities is technology, right? I think the way we make cities work effectively in the 21st century is using technology. And that's for good reason, because cities do stuff, right? Cities do things like things that are vital but totally mundane, like picking up trash, things that are vital but totally dangerous, like putting out fires. This is a picture of literally putting out a fire in Southern California this week. And then right. things are just simply vital, right, which is getting people to school. That's what cities do. Like, we do things, right? This is why I think people trust cities way more than they trust the federal government, because they know that we're the ones that are delivering the services that they need. Sometimes they do some cool stuff. So this is uh, a picture of the wicked cool tree in Boston. So this is a tree they set up in City Hall where you could tweet at this hashtag and it would change the color of the tree based on your tweet. They also did a thing in Boston where they took a food truck and repurposed it as a City Hall to go food truck. And they would do city services anywhere you wanted to go where they would have that there. So it's hard not to trust a city when they're that cool, right? Um, but I think most importantly, this is a, a quote from the mayor of Minneapolis, that there's no such thing as a Republican or Democrat way to pick up trash. <laughs> I mean, maybe I could take off my jacket or something. I don't know. But like, you know, there's no such thing as that. So that's an important perspective on local government, is that it's not about traditional partisan politics. It's about getting sorry for my language, getting shit done. And that's what we care about, and that's what we do. Again, I'm totally gonna get fired for saying that. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's government, right? So government's moving in this area that they have to focus on technology more. But technology is also really focusing on urban, right? So imagine, how many of you guys took Uber to get here? I thought more people than that would do that. Or Lyft, maybe, if I have that in there. OK, well, so in the event, there's a lot of new technology that only focuses on, or only is possible because of the urban environment, right? You couldn't have Uber if people didn't live in urban environments, right? There wouldn't be enough people around. You couldn't have Airbnb without urban environments, right? And Waze and Google Maps and everything else that we use on a daily basis only works because we all live in cities, which totally makes sense, because right now, 50% of the world's population lives in cities. 50%. In the next 10 years, it's gonna be 67% live in cities. So technology has to be fundamentally urban, right? And the most exciting technologies that we see are urban. So the last thing I wanna say, and I'm gonna get pulled off stage here in a minute, um, is that what's most exciting to me is bringing those two things together, right? The fact that we live in cities and we care about our cities and technologies and cities need technology and that technology is fundamentally urban. How do we bring those two things together? So let me give you an example of that, which I think is really, to me, the most exciting and promising thing about what's good for technology next. So in a city, if you have a heart attack, it takes about 11 minutes for a ambulance to get to you. If you bring that number down to eight minutes, 
you have a 67% more likelihood of not dying. Kind of important. <laughs> uh, the problem is cities are overwhelmed with 911 calls, so it's hard for them to respond to you. So there was an interesting company called PulsePoint that was launched a couple years back, helped launch it, and what they decided to do was, you know, you may know how to use a defibrillator, right? You may know how to help someone with their uh, heart attack, right? Why don't we ask you to do something because you're right there next to the person who's having the heart attack instead of asking the ambulance to come from 10 miles away or five miles away, right? There's someone right there who can help you, right? And there's an AD right there that can help you. So there's this company called PulsePoint that started that literally says this. It texts you if you launch the application that says, hey, someone's dying near you. Can you help them out? That's what's possible with technology, right? That's what's possible with cities, right? And I guess in closing, what I'll say is this, and you, know, you can't give a talk about cities without quoting Jane Jacobs, so I have to do this. Cities can provide, have the capacity, the capability of providing something for everyone only because and only when they are created by everyone. Blight status app wouldn't work if people weren't stepping up for Habitat for Humanity. The Pulse Point app wouldn't work if people weren't stepping up to do that, right? And so my call to action for everyone here is let's make Sacramento a fantastic, great new American city. Let's do what we can to make it better, and let's do what we can to be better citizens in the city. So thank you.